Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Sweepstakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Welcome to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez, and Brian Murphy with you here. As uh, it is here, football season is now upon us. We had media day earlier this week. We had the very first practice earlier today. Um, it's uh, it's happening, boys. The 2019-2020 athletic season uh, is underway. We are Black and Gold Banneret, SB Nation's home for the UCF Knights. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at UCF underscore Banneret, Facebook.com slash Black and Gold Banneret as well. Gentlemen, can you smell the fall yet? Oh, it's in the air, right? As we were getting out there this morning at 9 a.m. to watch the guys stretch and jog and just do smells like callus- Smells like freshly cut grass. Grass. Rained yes. on six hours last night. <laughs> it doesn't even matter if it's 8.45 in the morning. You're sweating buckets for the first five yeah. minutes of being out there. But, but at least, Jeffrey, to the larger point, we do have games now officially on the horizon. We're actually talking about real football uh, and not just well, we're still speculating, but at least we have something to speculate about, or at least we're getting closer to it. What's what's the old soundbite that they always talk about? Like it's fine, it's finally nice to to hit someone other than one another. Well, now it's like, oh, it's finally nice to finally hit someone. <laughs> right. I mean, they haven't even gotten pads on yet, but a lot of the guys talked about, or a lot of guys in the media day, and and then the guys we spoke to after the first practice today, we're just excited to be out there. You know, at least. Uh, uh, you know, in some sort of, you know, formal setting that looked like practice. They'll get pads on here in a couple of days. But, I mean, it, it, at least this is the start. The, the official training camp start 2019. So we'll talk about that starting out. We'll talk a little bit about Media Day. Eric Henry from uh, uh, Underdog Dynasty, he covers FIU, is going to join us. Of course, UCF announcing, well, not announcing, actually. It got leaked to Brett McMurphy that uh, UCF and FIU were starting a uh, um a uh, or, or restarting rather uh, a home and home series in 2020 and 2022. Um, Eric is going to talk about that and kind of the whole thing about football schedules for a little bit with us. And uh, we'll catch you up on everything else that's going on um, as well. But we start uh, this week with uh, media day, which was on, uh, on Tuesday morning. Uh, all three of us were there. It was good to kind of see everybody once again. Um, yeah, it's been a, uh, it, it's a, it, Here's the thing about Media Day, folks. Nothing happens. <laughs> it's 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 one of those things where just yes, we're all there. There is a press conference with Josh Heupel. Josh Heupel was there. Um, we're not going to play anything from it because, frankly, he didn't say anything that really that was really newsworthy at all. Um, it's an opportunity to get a bunch of content, basically for the for the for the upcoming month leading up to the preparations for the games. And a, lot um, and, of that, and a lot of that content is attached to stories that aren't even fleshed out yet because we need more content for those stories to work. Exactly. So it's just like it's like it's like it's like it's just baseline. It's like it's like just laying the ground for future things. I I challenged myself uh, to I, I talked to I think about six or seven players. I challenged myself to not ask them a single question about football, and I succeeded in that in that in that uh, <laughs> in that range. Um, the two questions that everybody I think was kind of on everybody's mind in media day was at least for Josh Heupel was a who's your quarterback, which he's not going to answer, and he and even even if he knew he wouldn't um, because practice obviously hasn't freaking started yet, and then b so about the schedule and. He wasn't going to answer that because his answer to that was, I trust Danny White. So um, we're not going to get into the whole schedule thing here because basically I've said all I need to say about it on Twitter already. You've been like work, working wars with my buddies like, you know, Stuart Mendel and, well, the Wolken, you know. 
Well, well, I'll, I'll leave it at this. They should get the facts right. But uh, anyway. Oh, the, uh, no. Well, yeah, that's why that's why Jeff doesn't that's why Jeff doesn't read the newspaper because it's garbage. <laughs> that's it. That's why that's why the industry's going down. No, I, I I read I read you, Murph. I read you when you when you when you're up in the Sentinel. That's you know I I I, well, I, I know who to trust in this business. <laughs> Jeffrey, if you're gonna if you're gonna get a if you're gonna throw a get your facts straight line, I'm gonna have to you know double up with more Mike Gundy content. I got lots more where that came from. It that speech no, 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 is still no, no, no. You're gonna have into to, my brain. You're gonna have to wait a few years for that on me, pal. I haven't hit the magical forty yet, so. Oh uh, boy! All right, so 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 did or right, just real quick, that was my take on Media Day. Did either of you guys find out anything interesting on Media Day? I, I found out some some interesting stuff about guys like personally. Like, I, I, did, I, I should clarify. Yes, I did too, but I'm not going to reveal it here. Right. Like, I, you know, again, this is a good, a good setting to get to know somebody a little bit. I mean, yeah, maybe we don't talk to a guy for more than five to six minutes at a time because we're trying to get to as many as, of the 18 players available as possible within this hour long period. So it's difficult to really delve into some stuff. But I mean, I talked to Jake Brown uh, about, you know, why he quit football basically back in the March of 2018 and what was behind that and, and the, you know what how did he come back and the, and the conversations he had with his coaches when he wanted to return to football uh, in the summer I thought that was pretty interesting uh, Richie Grant I t- I'll say it every time Richie Grant is an absolute joy to talk to he's honest he likes to talk um, he, he goes at length uh, with, with, with whatever he says um, I think uh, you know Brandon Moore had a bit of a spicy line where, you know, I asked him what the team goal is for this year, and he said playoffs. And I, you know, wanted to make sure he was mentioning, you know, CFP. And he goes, yeah. And I go, well, don't you think if you guys go undefeated that they'll leave you out again? And he goes, yeah, they probably will leave us out again. So I thought that was a, a, a funny line. Um, and Nate, and Nate yes, has, he's honest. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I, again, that's all we're looking for, right? And linebacker Nate Evans, who I think admittedly was one of the quietest guys last year, Really kind of felt almost like it was as if he was uncomfortable with the media. I sat with him almost until the tail end of media day, where everyone was leaving the room already. It was over, and I uh, just kept asking questions, and uh, he kept giving me these great answers, long answers. You know, just kept telling me, you know, if, yeah, if I had any more questions for him, like he wanted to answer more stuff. Um, that, that's great. That, that, that makes our job a lot easier. I, uh, I I didn't get the chance to talk to Nate or Adrian Killens. I really didn't want. I really wanted to. Um, I talked to Jordan Johnson. I talked to Jake Brown, um, Bam Moore, uh, Navel Clark, uh, Eric Mitchell. I had a great time talking to Eric Mitchell. I thought he was fantastic. Um, and, and Richie too. Richie is uh, Richie's great. And I and I hope that UCF fans, you know, will probably be hearing you know, a lot from those guys this year. And, uh, and, and with Richie, he's, he's, he's an all-star. Like he, he's become kind of one of my favorite players of the most recent, uh, the most recent period of time. So, uh, Eric, did you, uh, who were you able to, uh, to wrangle up on, uh, on media day? I talked to some of the players. I mean, it's not, I mean, I think they're a good group. It's a great group of guys that are confident. I think the interesting thing we got to remember, this is year now, I think they're more comfortable being in year two with this regime, right? Like we, we kind of forget that. This is just the second year of Josh Heupel and the staff. And I think that the players now understand what's going on. I think last year, even though they wouldn't say it, hey, we're not sure we're learning this on the fly. We're kind of, they're learning us, we're learning them. And, you know, I, I think that's the big thing, especially with Randy Shannon and his second year defensively. You know, and I think the big thing is a lot of people are excited about Randy Charlton, who's just a sophomore out of Southridge. And, you know, I'm talking to some of the players on the defensive side. They think he's their like their leader, if you will, a vocal leader. He's a guy that uh, I, I think there's a lot of excitement over him. And, and that's the Mike takeaway is I don't think uh, unlike fans, these guys aren't too worried about the quarterback situation. I think they know that they do their job. It's going to make their, the quarterback's job easier and they're going to be just fine. Yeah, I, I I agree with you on the um, on the point about the deep. I mean, let's not forget Scott Frost's second year. I mean, it, it was a very uneven first year, right? Six and seven, but just what, even if you didn't know the results, just watching the team played, it was kind of uneven at times. 
I felt like it was less uneven in Josh Heupel's first year. Obviously, they they won every game but the bowl game. Um, but there were times where you could kind of feel the team sort of feeling things out with the new coaching staff, sometimes on the fly, like right there on the field. Um, any coach or player that you talk to, um, you know, from any team will always tell you that the biggest leap is from year one to year two. When everyone's on the same page, everyone understands what's going on, everyone knows what's expected of them, and now you can work on the finer things. So I think that that's why the expectations, I think, remain high uh, for UCF. So, you know, Media Day was great, and I wanted to thank, um, uh, and we actually, I should say, wanted to thank uh, the whole staff from uh, UCF Athletics, uh, uh, from especially from the uh, communications department, uh, welcome to John Heisler, who we met for the first time, who's uh, come down after an illustrious career at Notre Dame uh, to run some media relations. Um, and uh, we wanted to also pass along a congratulations and a uh, and a happy trails. Uh, congratulations, by the way, to uh, Dan Forsella, who got married over the week. We, we missed Dan this week, but uh, uh, he was busy getting hitched. So congratulations to Dan and his beautiful wife. And uh uh, we also wanted to wish a very happy trails to uh, Ian McDougal, who is leaving UCF. Uh, My for, boy. Uh, I know. Yeah. Blue, that was emotion. That was emotional, going? Murph. I know. Oh. Come on. I know. It's so sad. I, 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 I'm going to miss Ian a lot. Ian, you've been a great help to us, and uh, um, it's been a blast working with you. And just you know, stay in touch. Don't, don't go. I know you'll be in Indiana, which is far away enough, but don't stray too far. Uh, yeah. Thanks again for all of your for all of your help all throughout the Ian's, year. Ian's pulling a Scott Frost. He's going home. He's uh, going back home. To the, to the school that he... Uh, it was his only... It, it, I, I feel confident saying that that's, the, that, that that's the only school he would have left UCF for. I feel pretty confident yes. saying. So, he, yeah, he took a job with Purdue, who, uh, which he uh, served as a, a kicker for in his, grad, I think his graduate year at, at Purdue. And then uh, he grew up about 45 minutes. From, uh, so yeah, he's from it, he's it, from Indianapolis, so uh, so yeah. he gets to go back home to more familiar, uh, if significantly colder in the winter uh, pastures. So um, thanks, Ian, and all the best. So um, all right, so that takes us to earlier today, which was Wednesday. Brian Murphy, you were at a uh, practice, which oh, yeah. uh, you know all the reporters that were there were able to get you know some video or whatever of the players, you know, kind of stretching, and you know that's. That's about it. I think, you know, practice is kind of a loose term for it on the first day because the players all reported yesterday, uh, all reported yesterday. So um, but you did get the chance to talk to uh, to, to talk to uh, two of the quarterbacks in UCF's roster, um, Brandon Wimbush and um, and Dylan Gabriel, obviously with Daryl Mack out because of injury. And I want to pay due respect to Quadra Jones. He's in the mix, too. Um, but it seems, at least at that moment, that it might be a two-horse race between those two guys, the grad transfer from Notre Dame and the true freshman from uh, Hawaii. So, um, well, I, I mean, what were your impressions of them, Murph? Because we didn't see them at media day because we were getting them today, obviously. But right. um, but, uh, but your impressions? I think all, all the guys seem confident, and I don't want to completely exclude Quadra Jones here. Well, I would hope so. They're I, I, <laughs> I mean, he's in there. Uh, so we talked to all three guys, but, you know, I, I think, you know, we want to be really honest and maybe gave uh, um, Josh Josh some concern. I do think that Wimbush and, and, and Gabriel are the top two. But, you know, and, but I think all three sounded really confident today. And, they, and we all asked them about you know, the, the competition and all of them, uh, you know, seemed like they, they like sounded very, like, uh, like very self-assured in their own talent. They can go out there and, and, and win the job, even though they all like each other and it's brotherhood and all that. They understand it's a competition. Um, I think the big question with Wimbush is, is you know, it, it just his accuracy and, and stuff like and, you know, he, that's the reason why he lost the job at Notre Dame last year. But the fact that he came from Notre Dame is, you know, the reason why he should be considered for this job because he, he played in huge games for a couple of years for a big university. He played in games where Notre Dame beat uh, Michigan State, USC, LSU. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, he, he knows that that is a feather in his cap. And I've got a little clip here uh, from uh, from today's presser uh, with about Brandon Wimbush talking about 
how that experience will serve them well in this competition. Why should you be the starter? I think you said it. Uh, more than anything, I come with experience playing at a at a pretty high level uh, against pretty good competition um, week in and week out. And um, I'm not going to say I'm the guy for the job, but I think those attributes help me, you know, put me in a good position to hopefully step out there on uh, August 29th. And, um, but I know we'll get into it, but, you know, it's good competition with these guys, the rest of the guys and the quarterback room. But I think those things, you know, give me a good shot. Uh, that was uh, Brandon Wimbush uh, discussing his pre- prior experience at Notre Dame. You know, just what, just once, I think it would have been funny for some of these quarterbacks just to mess with everybody and just say, just, just act the complete opposite of confident. Be like, I don't know what I'm doing here. Like, I, I parked my car inside the stadium yesterday, and I'm quite frankly frightened out of my mind. But I think what I mean, by, I think what I mean by that is none of them were hedging anything at all. Like. Quadri came out and said, like, we asked him what his mindset was. Somebody asked him what his mindset was. And he said, flat out, I'm here. My mindset is to dominate. Like, I love it. I love it. Like, just be out there and be brash. Tell me how good you are. I, and this is a kind of a, a sidebar. I want more good athletes to go on record telling me how good they are. That <laughs> I want that. Because there's too much of this, like, well, you know, I'm just fortunate and I have this talent. I'm just trying to do the best. Whatever. No, like if you're good, tell me you're good. I want to know that. And so I like to hear that kind of stuff. <laughs> Are you good at football? Well, you know, I, I have my moments. <laughs> <laughs> now you also talked to Dylan Gabriel, who I was really, I, I saw some of what he was talking about earlier. I was really impressed with, um, I mean, he, he know he knows, he he knows how to play, how to how to write the script for a quarterback too. Pretty not bad for an eighteen year old kid, huh? No, and he, it's funny. I asked him, you know, what were his impressions about day one of his first college football camp, and his first words were, "I'm just super stoked." And if there's anything you can tell the guys from Hawaii, it just sounds like a guy who grew up on the island. Super um, stoked, dude. Super stoked, Brad. Uh, <laughs> but no, it's great. He's, he's very loose. Again, another confident kid. You know, he, he talked, you know, and I put it up on Twitter, a picture of him saying, you know, I'm ready. You know, I, I trust that I'll be ready, you know, you know, on August 29th when they open up. Um, but I think when, when it comes to Dylan, obviously because it was a lot uh, his, uh, his roots, we got to tie it back into to McKenzie Milton a little bit. You know, they both went to the same high school. And so I did ask uh, Dylan if he had contacted McKenzie recently and kind of picked his brain about – what training camp is like and what their conversations have been like. And, and certainly those two have talked. And here is Dylan right now talking about what he and Casey have discussed. Me and Casey are super close. Yeah. You know, he's a brother to me. Mm-hmm. Um, love that guy. Um, he's out, he's out, you know what I mean? Been through it. Um, so every, everything I can, I mean, I'm not shy with questions. <laughs> I hit him up. Um, every time I can, we FaceTime as much as we can. So. Is there a question that, that was maybe you had most for him, something that you really wanted to know from him? No, I just I texted him. You know, I said I love him. He texted me back. He just said, go out there and compete. You know what I mean? Earn it. Dylan Gabriel, quarterback for uh, UCF. Now, I, I mean, as we look forward to whatever, I mean, they didn't really talk much about practice schedules, right? I mean, they're going to ease into, you know, pads and all that. But, yeah, you know, obviously – Practices were Remember the days when like all the practices used to be, used to be open. I guess I right. don't. That was you don't. Okay, I remember when they all used to be open. I think that was in the Cruzek era, and yeah. and I remember Larry when the era was also open, mostly open. Then he closed them. Remember that? And there was a huge uproar um, about that. Yeah, like because because it used to be that fans would come out. And watch, and and you could watch practice, and then they closed it off because you you know, I mean, you could say what you know, was he worried about espionage? I don't know, cell phones, the whole thing, but um, but I remember there was a big to do about that, and I was like, dude, like of course you would close practice. This is major division one football. You don't want anyone sneaking around on on stuff, you know. I mean, so well, yeah, because you know the NFL, you know the most. Paranoid league. They open practice to everybody, but somehow college football D one, you know, oh, gotta hide it. Come on, let's, well, not, let's uh, defend all these coaches from doing that. I'm not gonna go that. Far. I well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just not it. gonna. I'm not gonna blame coaches for being like, you know what, guys, let's. 
it's it's time for us to focus here. There's no crowds here in practice. All right, let's 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 focus on doing our job. I, I don't I don't blame them. I don't blame them at all. So, um, but uh, you know, I mean, here we are. It's it's time to practice, and we have how many days, Murph, until the first game? Twenty nine days. Twenty nine days. So, all right, twenty nine days till FAMU, and yep. and here and here we go. So, um. Yeah, I mean, it's just it, it's it 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 starts now. <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it's it's going to be a grind for these guys. Anything else that you came up with came away with from practice, or uh, I came away that I need to be there extra early because for now they are going pretty. They're, they're, they're not gonna get these guys. Ready. Like Heibel said that he kind of wanted to take it easy on the guys early on in camp. So a practice that really kind of started at eight forty five was supposed to go till about eleven ten. Uh, actually wrapped up today at about eleven, about ten forty, uh, which may have left some media members <clears throat> in a lurch <laughs> when they come to the Nicholson Fieldhouse to uh, be ready for Josh Heupel's uh, opening statement. And sure enough, hey, he's already talking. Uh, so uh, yeah, but uh, that's about it. I mean, obviously, no one's yeah. gonna name his, no one's gonna name his daughter, but uh, you know, it was nice at least talking to them today. And you know, everyone's going to speculate. Everyone's going to pick apart every thing that gets said from now to the next 29 days or however, whenever Josh Heupel decides to name the starter, listen, mm-hmm. don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Whoever it is that comes out. And, and that's, that's why you have, that's why you have a game against an opponent like F, F, F like fam, you in the first game is to iron all that out. So soon enough, we'll find out, you know, uh, speaking of schedules, <laughs> Uh, we're going to take a break and we come back. Oh boy. Yay. More schedule talk because you know, that's what we do. We're going to talk to Eric Henry, our, uh, our good friend and a fellow UCF alumnus. Uh, he works for, uh, underdog dynasty. He covers FIU, UCF and FIU sort of at the center of the college football scheduling world, as it were the last 24 to 36 hours or so. We'll talk about that and talk about the state of that state of that program and, how the series sort of came to be uh, in just a moment. Stick around. We'll be right back. This is the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to Cars.com. It's magical. Welcome back to the Black and Gold Banneret podcast. Jeff Sharon, Brian Murphy, and Eric Lopez joining you. Black and Gold Banneret, UCF underscore Banneret on Twitter. And joining us now to talk a little bit more football uh, and the FIU Panthers hopping back on the schedule for 2020 and 2022 is one of my favorite follows on Twitter. Uh, he is a UCF graduate, and somehow he got roped into covering FIU for Underdog Dynasty, one of our uh, SB Nation sister sites eric henry joining us uh here on the black and gold banneret podcast what's up eric man thanks for that introduction uh you're right somehow i got roped into it and uh and here i am but uh, it's it's great to be among uh alumni here that's a rarity you know it, it seems to be uh the, the common theme is uh pause up seems to be the common theme in my life over the past uh year so it's great to be among some uh some fellow alumni here we, we have to we we have to, we maintained as an alumni meeting here just to you know pull you pull you back from pull you back from the depth so uh all right so i want to talk about fiu here like we we bounced around a little bit about in the in the first segment about the about the the national um narrative about oh ho, ho, you schedule it a one and one with fiu you know i'm not going to get into that here i just want to talk about um fiu itself you know it, this is uh butch davis obviously still the head coach at uh at FIU, his first game at FIU was actually a loss to UCF two years ago in the in the opener, the first game of the thirteen and zero season for the Knights. But last year, FIU had a pretty good year. They went eight and four, six and two in conference uh, USA. They won the Bahamas Bowl against Toledo uh, in a tight ball game. And you know, and now I, I'm I'm a fan of 
any kind of football in the state of Florida. And I feel like FIU, uh, it, which is also a, people forget like how big that school is. It's it still has a reputation as a as a commuter school, obviously, but there's a it feels like they're trying really hard it, it, like to push the boulder uphill on building foot on building a, a legit football program up there. What's the state of the Panthers program right now as they enter year three under Butch Davis? It's really a, a tale of two stories, guys. You know, the state of the actual football program, it, it couldn't be better. I mean, you guys know the the type of pedigree that Butch Davis brings in terms of uh, recruiting Cachet. No matter where he's been at his stops, whether it's been Miami or North Carolina, he's always been able to recruit. And being back in South Florida, uh, his name holds a lot of weight amongst, uh, you know, a lot of South Florida households. He, he's in this in his first two years, he's had easily the top two recruiting classes in FIU history, according to the uh, 24-7 sports ranking. So to say the football program is fine. Now, you kind of touch on something there, Jeff, that's, that's really interesting. And being a UCF alum, I was really uh, I was surprised at the I'd only been to FIU's campus one time. And the first thing I think you notice is just the lack of college environment. Like it's kind of just a university that just pops up out the middle of nowhere. Um, and I think the reason I mentioned that is because, you know, the, 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 no secret that the school has struggled with attendance. I mean, their, their paid attendance on average is 15,000, but that's paid attendance for a reason. If you talk about physical attendance, uh, they probably only average somewhere around three to 4,000 fans a game. I want to say the highest is probably about 8,000 for the annual Shula bowl. Uh, and you did say they went eight and four. I, they went nine and four. The only reason I mentioned that is because that was their program record for wins in a year, which goes to show you just how young that program is. Uh, the talent level is just, you know, booming by the day. They already uh, have had five transfers from uh, schools like Boise State, schools like Kentucky. Uh, there's, it's kind of rumored right now. It's not 100 percent sure whether uh, J.J. Holdeman, who was a uh, wide receiver at Georgia, started six games for them last year and was their fourth leading receiver. Uh, he's been in talks. He visited the campus last week and talks that he might be making the move to FIU, a former four-star recruit. So the actual football program is going great, but getting fan support in South Florida, that's a different story. And, and well, and the question is, though, is that sustainable? I mean, Butch, Butch is tremendous. He knows that area very well, but you mentioned the lack of attendance. That's a Miami. First of all, that's a pro sports town. You got the Miami Heat, the Miami Dolphins. Florida Panthers, even the Marlins, if you call them a professional team, which, you know, it's very debatable, but nonetheless. Uh, but you also have the Miami Hurricanes. And, and you know, I grew up down there, and everybody grew up on those national championships. And if you're – they support winners. And, it, and, look, I know a lot of people that went to FIU, and that's one of those things where a lot of people that go to FIU are Hurricane fans. And I just – is this sustainable, Eric? I think that's the question because they had success with Mario Cristobal. And then, you know, the great genius of the athletic director, uh, Pete Garcia, or as he likes to call himself, the executive director of sports and entertainment, uh, got rid of Mario Cristobal. And the program went straight to down to with, uh, with Turner. So how sustainable is this? Guys, I look at the situation where FIU is right now, and I just point to UCF. I mean, I, I was at UCF from 2010 to 2015. When I got to UCF, guess what? It, it, this might be shocking to some people who choose to act like, you know, pre-Scott Frost didn't exist. But there was plenty of times when you could walk across campus and see just as many uh, UF sweatshirts, Florida State sweatshirts, as opposed to UCF. So uh, I mentioned that to say that I think they're at the point right now where it's a matter of creating that. FIU fan base, right? So it, it was never cool. I mean, think about it. You, you talk about the the 2001 Miami Hurricanes, one of the you know greatest football teams of all time. That swag, that culture. That's the cool thing to want to be a part, right? Just the same way when you know when a lot of us were at UCF, it wasn't cool to be a UCF fan. Like you you went to the games because it was great tailgate, great great environment. But at the end of the day, it was cool to be a Florida State fan or, or a Gator fan. And, and so it's just a matter of creating that second wave of fans. Now, to answer your question specificity, is it sustainable? Um, I, I do believe it is because you have to get that that fan base growing. But also, uh, more than anything else, South Florida, as you mentioned, likes winners. And as long as Butch Davis can keep the program going in the right direction, I think eventually they'll be able to grow enough of a fan base with the university being almost 50-something thousand students to where eventually it will be trendy to go to FIU games. Uh, I, I hope that's not being too optimistic, but I just look at it. I mean, Jeff even said this when we talked after the uh, AAC championship game last year. 
FIU is more or less what UCF was. Jeff said 20 years ago, I, I would say 10, but they're, they're there. It's just a matter of building that culture and environment. I think the big difference, I disagree that they're, they're like UCF because UCF didn't have to deal with four pro teams. Uh, and they didn't have a program right literally in the same city. They won five national titles. And this is the question I have. I was there six years ago when they played in that stadium. I've been to that stadium covering high school games. What is this? If, what is, has there been any chatter about the facilities, the stadium uh, for FIU? Because I think they're going to have to you know, figure that out, which is not easy. Eric, it's funny, right? So there's it, it, that dichotomy comes down to like there's two sides to it. You have the people who say expand the stadium, expand the stadium, just like expand it. And I'm not on that side because why are you worrying about expanding a stadium when you're only getting seven thousand people in it? You just like, you're, you're gonna, yeah. gonna look worse. Um, it, it, now, as far as outside of the stadium, the facilities itself. Oh, they're they're getting better. Butch uh, in his in his second year, which was last year, he got the uh, new practice fields put in, and that's really helped a lot. But unfortunately, you know, it's South Florida, so it rains, you know, every day at four o'clock. And there have been times where they've had to have practice, you know, um, uh, rescheduled or, or or canceled because of that. So that's uh, as far as their facilities go. It, it's a double edged sword. But the, in specificity to the stadium. Yeah, I, I'm not of the belief that they should expand it just because no. you got to worry about filling it first. No, I agree, and and but that's my. I kind of think they're more like in the South Florida range because I, FAU has the on-campus stadium, so I think they have the advantage there. They're in Boca, uh, you know. To, I think it's more suitable there. That's kind of my concern with them as we move forward post Butch, because I think they'll be successful under Butch. But what happens post Butch? Unless unless Butch, you know, has a second, you know, coaches forever, which you never know. He's gotten second life now, but. That's kind of my concern, and you know, I took a shot at Pete Garcia because I don't think their administration's very good at all. Whereas I definitely have more confidence in FAU's administration than I do at FIU. That's my concern. Okay, so once again, it's really two sides as far as Pete Garcia, right? So here's why I fall on that. What he did in the past is is in the past, and um, a lot's been made of it from FIU faithful. There, there is a vocal contingency of FIU fans who will never forgive Pete Garcia for his past moves. That's just is what it is. But you look at his previous or his last two hires, Butch Davis and Jeremy K. Ballard, the basketball coach. Uh, FIU set a single season record for basketball wins with uh, once they had 22 or 23 wins and made some uh, small postseason tournament. But the fact of the matter is they made a postseason tournament coming off of, you know, the debacle that was um, Anthony Evans and, of course, the Isaiah Thomas uh, uh, era as far as basketball goes. And then, of course, we know what Butch Davis has done. So, I mean, look, if you want to sit there and live in the past and live in 2012, I'm not accusing you of this, Eric. I'm just saying speaking yeah. broadly. Uh, you know, you can do that. But the fact of the matter is he's gotten his last two hires right. And let's at least focus on what he can do to get things moving in the right direction going forward, as opposed to holding the Mario Cristobal and uh, firing and the Isaiah Thomas hiring um, from how many years ago, you know, to his name. Well, Eric, Eric Henry, let's take, uh, oh, go ahead, uh, Murph. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, Eric, let's take it to the field for a minute. Uh, when you look at the team overall uh, and, you, and, you know, let's say I'm watching I'm watching an FIU game. Who am I looking out for? Who am I going to watch for? And really, for as a as a UCF fan, who do I need to watch on FIU? Maybe maybe a younger guy or younger guys, sophomores and juniors, who could be a problem for UCF, uh, not this season, but in 2020 when they play each other. Sure. So I'm going to take the second half of that question first because I think it's sure. the most pertinent to, to UCF. Um, unfortunately for for uh, FIU fans, they're going to graduate James Morgan this year, who uh, is a transfer from Bowling Green, and he's just become a, a legit NFL prospect. So, you know, he'll be gone. Uh, Stone Norton is a three-star recruit. He was actually the highest-rated quarterback recruit in the history of FIU football. It essentially is going to be his show next year. I mean, they're looking to turn the keys over to him. So he at, at quarterback is one guy. The defensive secondary, especially as UCF, you know, has a strong passing attack. That's something that you have to look for. Richard Dames and Richard Dames. They're twin brothers, uh, three-star recruits out of Booker T. Washington High School. Uh, Richard was actually the guy who was actually the, the, you know, the highly touted guy. And, and Richard was like, you know, the brother you take with him. But both of them just turned out to be studs in the defensive backfield. Richard was actually, uh, according to – <clears throat> excuse me, according to Pro Football Focus, was one of the highest rated safeties in Conference USA last year. So along with him, another name I want to give you is Tyson Mavey, who 
was the second leading tackler for Boise State in 2017, the third leading tackler for them in 2018 before he was dismissed because of a marijuana incident prior to their bowl game. He's going to be eligible for them next year. So returning on defense, they're going to have a lot of studs, guys like Mave, um, uh, uh, potentially a Jeremiah Holdman, the kid I mentioned, the wide receiver from Georgia. So they're going to have a lot of talent. Lexington Joseph was a, a four-star recruit as a, as a running back out of Miami Central High School as well. So those are all names who, if you're a UCF fan, expect to see them next year. You won't see them this year, but expect to see them next year. Uh, and then just really quick, as far as guys you may notice this year, uh, James Morgan, like I mentioned, uh, C- Coach Butch Davis said that he could be a third or fourth round pick as a quarterback. I won't necessarily go that high. I mean, he has... He looks like a quarterback out of central casting. I mean, 6'5", 225. The, the way I like to describe James is uh, if, if Mackenzie Milton had James Morgan size, he'd be the first overall pick in the NFL draft. Mm-hmm. Um, but J- James has, has a big time arm. I mean, smart kid, uh, graduate from Bowling Green in three years, getting his master's at FIU, just looks and sounds like a quarterback. But uh, he's one guy. And then linebacker Sage Lewis, who was voted as the preseason defensive player of the year in the entire conference of Conference USA. We're here with uh, Eric Henry talking about FIU. So the series that uh, FIU and UCF have agreed to do uh, is in 2020 and 2022. 2020 is going to be in Orlando. 2022 is going to be back down in um, Miami. The all-time series as of right now, these two teams have played pretty frequently, actually. For, uh, in six games, uh, UCF has won uh, four of them. Um, of course, the most recent one was in uh, 2017, 61-17. UCF defeated um, FIU prior to that, 53-14 down in Miami and Scott Frost's first year. Um, I feel like a lot of the games between these two schools have been you know, eventful one way or the other. You know, we had the two big Scott Frost uh, blowouts. Um, FIU beat uh, UCF 15-14 to in 2015 in the opener. That started the downward slide for UCF that year. Um, UCF did defeat, uh, FIU, uh, two consecutive years in 2012 and 2013. Going back to the very first meeting back in 2011, FIU actually won that game. That was, that was kind of, I remember that being kind of the coming out party for T.Y. Hilton when he was at FIU. Yeah. And that's when everyone kind of looked, oh, wow, what's, what's this? We have FIU, huh. we have Mario Cristobal, we have this, this T.Y. Hilton guy who seems to be pretty good. So, uh, it's been a pretty eventful series between these two. Projecting ahead to 2020, and I know that we're we're like getting way ahead of ourselves here, and we're doing exactly what coaches don't want to do, but we're not coaches, whatever. Um, could this be a sleeper game for UCF, if, assuming all things go well for both of these squads in 2019? Is this going to be a game where in 2020 and possibly in 2022 that UCF fans are going to we're probably going to be sweating this out a little bit more than maybe they think right now. Jeff, you know, that question is probably the entire reason why I'm on the podcast. You know, I, I DM'd you kind of making that exact point. Uh, okay. While FIU will graduate James Morgan and Sage Lewis in 2019, just the amount of talent that they have returning in terms of, like I said, the amount of three and four star guys who are, are red shirting, uh, who haven't played, who will be playing in 2020. It, it's a ton. And to bring it all the way around from a UCF fan's perspective, what you should be concerned about is this. There isn't a team on the schedule in 2019 outside of UM who FIU, in terms of talent-wise, can't match up with, if not um, equally, if not have more talent than them. So the best case scenario, if you're a UCF fan, is that this team wins Conference USA, wins 10 games, 11 games, and finishes the season ranked, you know, somewhere in, in in the 25, 24, 23 range, and then at least you have an opponent on your schedule where they come in with some name recognition and you've got a quality G5 game. I mean, look at what UCF and FAU was billed to be last year, right? You had right. FAU co- coming off their conference championship season and going to, you know, the powerhouse G5 school in, in UCF. And you have a solid game. And for me, just my perspective is that I saw some of the chatter on Twitter with, you know, um, uh, UCF Twitter is, is that why are we scheduling FIU again? We might as well just schedule an FCS. I don't want to go down that route again. Trust me, this game is going to be much more important to your schedule than just any write-off FCS. And I genuinely believe this with my heart, that if this team does, this team being FIU, plays to their potential, you could have a solid game, even for strength of schedule purposes with FIU, uh, that would really make a difference. So I think it's something that F- that UCF fans should really take notice 
And quite frankly, should be cheering for FIU this year because you just want anything that can you point to your schedule and say, hey, we're playing teams. Anyone who will who will take us, we're playing them and beating them. Well, that's the best case scenario for both schools, right? Because, you know, if UCF's argument is, hey, you know, get off our behinds about scheduling FIU, it, it helps. The, the argument is helped if FIU is really good, right? And, and, and you, you talked to me earlier. Uh, we were chatting on Twitter a little bit earlier. And, yeah, I think this, this is, you know, for a G5 opponent that UCF scheduling philosophy for the last, what, guys, decade or so has been we're going to try and get two autonomous five teams one non-autonomous five at a conference team and one FCS uh, cupcake to start basically to start the season. And I've always thought that a matchup with FI, FIU and, to, and FAU is actually beneficial for UCF because it's Why? in state. It's, it's in state. And, and you, you can, have, oh, and you can actually here, like, okay, hold on, hold on. Here's take the a thing. road trip down to Miami or Boca. You can bring your South Florida recruits up there to have that. Yeah, you can and, do that anytime a, you want without, you can do that whenever you want. Here's the concern, Eric. And, you brought it up, why this is a problem. You're right. I agree with everything you've said, that FIU is definitely could be a threat. I called it when they beat UCF in 2011 with T.Y. Hilton. That was a good team with Mario Cristobal um, and, and those teams. So I'm, I'm not surprised at all that Butch Davis is doing that. The problem is UCF has nothing to gain from this game. FIU has everything to gain on this. This is their game. UCF is supposed to beat FIU, and you're not going to convince a fan base that beating FIU is, is something of an accomplishment. And if they lose, it's catastrophic. Uh, that's just the reality. It, and I don't think it's going to change because of that. I don't, it, that's the problem that I think some UCF fans have. I don't have a personal issue with it, but that's just the reality. And I don't think the national media will ever give them, oh, they beat a 10-win FIU team. You know that's not going to happen. Come on. Uh, Jeff, did you want to jump in that first, or do you want me to take that? Yeah, go ahead. I got because I mean, because I, I, I want to know your perspective. Like you're you're that close to that program. What do you think? So uh, you know, I I was starting to disagree with Eric, but he brought it back around. That is from the UCF perspective. I do yeah, yeah. think that I do think that you kind of have very little to gain, and 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 what little you have to gain is the fact that it's not. This is my opinion. It's not an FCS team. I do believe that. It, it, I agree with that. Sure. I agree sure. with that for the record. I do agree. I don't agree that you should be scheduling an FCS game. I, in fact, sure. I don't think FCS games should be scheduled, period, in, sure. in by anybody in Division One. for the record. So I do not sure. fall under, under that thinking for, for the record. Yeah. It, yeah. And, and I mean, it's not sure. FIU is not going to get the respect that, you know, unfortunately, for better or worse, and don't get me started on this, FIU is not going to get the respect that even beating a Vanderbilt would be. And, and we can talk about how bad historically Vanderbilt's been in, in the SEC, you know, going back 50 years. But it, it, that win won't get that respect. Right. It just but, looks bad for Vandy. It doesn't look good for FIU. Go ahead. It, 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 no, no, no. Exactly. Yeah. So, Eric, in, in that sense, you're right. Where I will disagree, and I got into a debate with uh, with a UCF fan that's on Twitter who was saying, oh, you know, do you really think uh, South Florida recruits really go to FIU games? Uh, is it really going to matter? Well, here's I'm just going to give you guys facts here. FIU's recruiting class in 2018 was 68th according to the, the 24-7 rankings. And this is no however much stock you put into rankings, but it's just going to you know put it out there. UCF's was 62nd. FIU has eight kids on their team from Central Florida, and they recruited three from the greater Orlando area, Orange, um, Seminole, and Osceola County, just within this past recruiting class. I'm not saying that they're going to come in and out-recruit UCF. But, yeah, you do want to go down to FIU and kind of get it in those South Florida kids' minds. Like, yeah, I know Butch is sitting here hitting you with that, you know, that magic, that Butch Davis recruiting touch. Remember us. We are the Knights. We are the, the, the dominant standard here in, in, in the state of Florida, not even just for G5 football, but quite frankly, for football uh, in college football in the state of Florida overall over the past 10 years. So I, I do think that there is some benefit to going and playing in front uh, of an FIU and at least reminding recruits, hey, we're here. Well, and I think the coaches might agree with you on that. I'm not saying that's not a that's not accurate. I mean, there is truth to that. But the question is, is that bigger game than the potential that you're going to play down there and lose to FIU and just get the ridicule that you're going to get? Because it is going to be ugly. And I, I know it's not fair because, again, I thought that FIU team was really good at 2011. It should have gotten more credit. But UCF fans didn't give them credit. They complained about the quarterback, Jeff Godfrey, this and that. And that's what's going to happen. It's ironic because UCF fans, we don't like it when we beat, you know, Auburn or whoever, and they don't get the credit. It's just, it's just how the sport is. Nobody ever gives anybody any credit. Let, but let me just quickly give you guys, I'm curious your guys' thoughts. Here's the flip side. Okay. God, you know, Lord help us. The worst case scenario, 
it gets out that UCF and FIU, you know, the, the Pete Garcia put it out there. Hey, come play us home for home. And it gets out there to Danny White says, nah, uh, I, I'm not looking at that. Could you imagine if, if the, the national, or not national, but just the, the ridicule that you guys are ducking FIU now? I mean, just that's just my flip side argument. Uh, I, I, okay, I see what you mean. I don't think it would quite get the consternation from the national media that it would having signed the series. I, 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 well, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong on that. But um, because the way that UCF would spin it, I think, would be, you know, well, hey, look, I, hey, we appreciate the offer, guys, but you know something, we're trying to we're trying to boost our schedule at least at this point, and you know, we're really sorry, but you know, this ain't the year for you. <laughs> um, that, that, that's the th- that's the thing. I that's how I think it would play. I don't know, Eric Lopez. What do you think? I don't know if people would make it big. I, look, we got to stop with the narrative that people are ducking people. Everybody's scheduling the way they got to schedule. But it's college like football, Eric. You know that. I mean, everyone's going to talk crap. Well, I and just that's, find that's it amusing something. because, you know, Alabama supposedly is ducking UCF, but yet they're playing Wisconsin Tech. They're playing good schedules every year. I don't think anybody ducks anybody. Everybody's got to do what's best for them. And I think that's my only point on it. Look, I'm not anti the FIU game, but I understand those because I've, I've, I'm sure you've heard of Merrick. Uh, I've got them too. There are people that are not happy about it for various reasons because they don't think they have anything. What's the gain from this game? Now, at the end of the day, you have to fill out a schedule. Right. Uh, and you, <laughs> right. I would rather schedule an FIU than an FCS game. I do agree with that. And I would agree that I think FIU is a better option than, say, a Sunbelt school, for example. I think FIU is a better option than a MAC school. What do you want to play Eastern Michigan on a home and home? And I think they're a much better option than a majority of the Mountain West teams so uh you know it's just the question i just don't know you know it, it is what it is though it's a kind of a tough no win situation for you right. yeah i mean i'll make it quick I, I just couldn't agree with you more as far as the other scheduling options and you have to look at realistically if you're a ucf fan what was left out there 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 weren't a ton of options left almost and- nothing in 2020 for sure i know that yeah and you get the opportunity to take your home fans who you know will travel ucf fans travel and it's a it's a three hour ride, and I just think this was the best case scenario given the options. Yeah, UCF is going to get an extra home game in twenty twenty two. I mean, out of that basically. Cause, there we go. See, you know, they, see there, Eric. You see, you see the little shots there. I mean, no, 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 no. Because, no, it's true though because they're going to play. They have two. UCF has two slots to fill. They have they have one uh, in twenty. It, I'm looking at the twenty twenty schedule um, right now. They're they're home for North Carolina. UCF is. Yep. And at Georgia Tech, we know that they're going to get an FCS game, or at least they're going to try and get if if Danny White is to be believed, they're going to get an FCS game that's going to be at home, obviously. And then they're playing FIU at home, so that's that's an extra home game there. You know, you have your you have your your four conference home games plus three uh, plus three non conference home games. So that's that's the benefit to. For UCF on that one, I'm actually surprised FIU kind of agreed. No, the 2022 that. games at FIU. No, the 2022. No, I'm games talking about 2020. Oh, the 2020. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and the reason why that's significant though is because, you know, like like you were saying, um, Eric, you know, you look at 2020, the options that UCF had available, and there aren't that many of them. TCU is out there. Arkansas is out there. Sure. Um, yeah, Miami just locked yeah. up their their remaining slot in 2020 with Wagner of all people. Uh, I think Florida it was Florida State, Army, Air Force, and South Carolina are the only ones that are available. So if they, if those you know, and, and you could say, well, why don't you get them? Well, you know, they're trying to fill out their schedule too, and if sure. they're trying Everybody to get something does. else, right. you know, they, they could say, no, no, thanks, we don't want to play a UCF. Call it call us for maybe 2023 or something like that. But. Um, yeah, but that but that's the that's that's the thing about 2020 that got kind of lost in the shuffle, um, I think a little bit was how many spots UCF or how many schools had a spot available and there weren't that many of them. Exactly. I mean, once again, you know, I just from that perspective, I just think, what were you going to do when you you look at the the positives and the negatives? Sure, you have one big elephant in the room, which is. You could lose that game. And I know that's not something that UCF fans want to hear, but the FIU program is one that is growing. That's the worst case scenario. But when you look at what was left, why not FIU? 
Right. And the coaches, too. I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> Josh Heupel doesn't, is not going to go into that game thinking, man, I hope we don't lose to FIU. I mean, he's, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that's, you know, that's their, uh, I think that's their MO at that point, too. Yeah, and you'd also ask, you know, um, you know, as far as UCF scheduling is concerned, I, I don't know how you would, I mean, I don't know. It, it, in the future, are are we looking at you know potential one offs here? I mean, we're kind of we're kind of in the position right now where maybe UCF could do a one off, but uh, with a with a power five uh, with an autonomous five team, I should say. But you know, it, it, the options are were obviously limited for twenty twenty, but I think there are a few options open for twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two. I just I just don't know that it would benefit them really at all if the objective is like Danny White said earlier today on. Um, Mike Bianchi show that, you know, I'm, we're not going to get into the playoff anyway. You know, we went undefeated two years in a row heading into the postseason, and, and we got, and we got nothing out of it. So I'm going to do what's best for my program in terms of it. And what he didn't say was, I'm going to do what's best for my program's bottom line, which is trying to get you. as many yeah, home right. games as humanly possible yeah, 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 and yeah. try and get to that new year six bowl game as the highest ranked non a five team and collect that gigantic check at the end of the year. And I don't blame him for that. I don't, I don't know why. I don't know what is so hard for national media, like Stuart Mandel and, and, uh, and, uh, you're the one that has a and, problem and, with and, it. And you're the one that's all to understand that. I don't know why, I don't know why it's so hard for them to understand it. The information's all out there. You're a journalist. Go figure it out. That doesn't mean they have to agree with it. They don't care that UCF's trying to make money. Everybody's trying to make money. I understand it. Why are everybody has multiple sides to the story on this? I don't think it's that big of a deal, Eric. Personally, I think it's good. I think hopefully FIU does. You're right. I think you brought up the point, Eric. Here's the thing. We'll just finish on this. My point is this: FIU's got to get to that level, kind of where FAU was, Eric, a couple years ago with the Lane Kiffin momentum. Right? They win the league. He's getting all the attention. Wow, look at FAU. Can you know FIU's got to win the conference to get there, right, Eric? That's the main sure. thing here. No, no, without without question. You know, it, it, all, all things considered, FIU has to win the league, and they have more than enough talent to win this right. league. It's it's really laughable the embarrassment of riches that 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 Butch Davis has accumulated as far as talent there. So for this even to be a possibility, you know, for a 2020 matchup with UCF, FIU has to do their job. Uh, really quick, I, and this is the question I, I'd want to ask you guys. Okay. Um, this is just my my perspective. My my concern is this: um, UCF's going to get to a point where <laughs> this ain't going to earn me any brownie points. They're they're not in the in the um, athletic financial restraints that FIU is right. So the, the program is making money and they're earning money at a record rate. They're going to get to the point where the argument can't be, well, this is bad for my bottom line. What else is there? And my biggest concern, this is what I said to Jeff on Twitter, is sure, maybe it's not a home and home. But what happens when you have that magical season like 17 or 18 outside of the LSU game where all things line up perfectly? And maybe the one thing missing from your resume is a road win at a premier power five school and it's a one off. You can't sit here and tell me that and this is just my opinion that the 2018 UCF Knights wouldn't have had a legitimate chance at the playoff. And anyone who follows me on Twitter knows how small of a chance I think it is for any G5 to make the playoff. But well, I let think me, they let, me, let me let me expand your point because I don't I, I know where you're coming from, Eric. Okay, because okay? yeah. I know Jeff's going to say, well, it wouldn't have mattered. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. I disagree yeah. with Jeff. I think you. I think Houston in 2016 would have gotten in if they would have gone undefeated because they would have beaten Oklahoma, won the Big 12. So I do think there's a, a door. Yes, it's a it's a it's a tougher door to get in, but I think there's a door. But let's go 2025, and there's an 18 playoff all of a sudden, but there's no guarantees. There's no automatic bids. So how do you get into an 18 league? I think that's your point, right, Eric? You want you still want to try to schedule some games to impress people. Now it's tricky because. A team that might be good right now might not be good in five years, and a team that's not good right now could be good. And that's always the tricky thing with scheduling. But I do think you bring up an interesting point, right? That's your point is do you still want to have build your resume up, right? It, it, no, without question. I This is my opinion. With a healthy Mackenzie Milton, I, I, don't, I think 
they could, UCF could have beaten every team except for two last year, in my opinion, being uh, Alabama and Georgia. Uh, and and I would give them a fighting Clemson, chance. I think both. Clemson. Uh, sorry, and 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 in Clemson, and I would have given them a fighting chance against all three. So th- that's my opinion. So what happens when you have that perfect storm? You have Mackenzie Milton. You have you know all the pieces set, and you're only missing that one game. Which sure, you may have to eat it. It may have to be a one-off road game. But at the end of the day, I think you're just the argument about finances eventually is going to come to an end if UCF tra- trajectory keeps going the direction it is. And then it's going to come down to the player saying, hey, we're doing our job on the field. We want a shot to play the big boys. And, and Jeff, Jeff may be completely right in terms of there's not, not a snowball's chance in hell that they'll ever let a, a, a G5 in the playoff. I don't know, but I just think that you have to at least give yourself that chance if it's a one-off. Because that's my concern. You're going to have that magical season like 17 and 18, and you don't have it if you don't have that that game. Whether it's a one-off, I don't know. But I just I, I'm just curious your guys' thoughts. You know, I, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't know. The only way we're going to know is if some team other than UCF has a season like that. And you know, like let's let's say we have a replay of Houston in 2016, where they they knock off a team of the caliber of Oklahoma. You know, I for one still think that you know the excuse that's going to be trotted out is, well, there, well, it's it that's a we, it's a weak year for that team. I, it, it's it's not going to come down to, I mean, it, and and that's where well, I agree. Oklahoma I, won the big. The difference is with that is Oklahoma won the Big Twelve, so you can't use that. They won the Big Twelve. They went to the Sugar Bowl. Well, and won. Well, Louisville well, played with a Heisman Trophy winner, and Houston would have had a better resume than Washington. That's but, the difference. But like you said, Eric Lopez. There is no hard and fast criteria for Correct. selection Correct. of the college football playoff, which means that if it's a wholly owned subsidiary of the autonomous five conferences, which it is, then you, then, yeah. then they can find – they're free to find any excuse that they want to leave that hypothetical Houston or Boise State or Fresno State team or FIU team but I think that Eric, matter. I think, I, think, I think Eric's point is – Make them do that. Don't give them the out, right? Is that your point, Eric? Is that your what you're the, the, well, it's More or less, yes. But has, hasn't UCF done that the last two years, though? I mean, you no. can't change your schedule on the fly, right? And plus, you know, let's not forget, <laughs> UCF had that game at, at North Carolina last year wiped out because of a hurricane. Let's, yeah, say they, let's say they win that game. So you mean to tell me that a win at North Carolina would have pushed UCF over the top? No, I'm no, not but so North, sure. North, North, you're missing the point, North yeah, go ahead, Eric. Go ahead. You're, I know you're going to no, say the same. I think. No, no. Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, trust me. I completely un- agree with with you, Jeff. What you're saying as far as a win over North Carolina ain't going to do it. But that's another pedestrian school that it hasn't been really great at football, you know, over the right. past 30, 40 years. My point is, a win in North Carolina won't, but a win at Georgia or a win at presuming you can get the game scheduled, a one off, a win at a premier power five, or as you say, uh, uh, you know. The the um, you say autonomous five is that what you call them? Yeah, the, well, that's the, what the uh, NCAA yeah. calls them. So, I so mean, they, okay, yeah. okay. Like, so I'll get on the record. A win at that type of school, a premier school, make them put you out uh, because you can point to North Carolina and say, all right, yeah, North Carolina down year and they're pedestrian anyways. But guess what? You can't point to Clemson. You can't point to Georgia. You can't point to you know Oklahoma and and say that's the case. Um, it, it, we we know, uh, all being products of, of a G five school. It ain't going to be easy, but I at least want to, like Eric said, make them say no and at least give them all the reason to, to, to put it back in their court. Yeah. I mean, the thing I the, like, I think back to 2017, right, Eric, is that, you know, yeah, there was the, the Georgia Jeff, Tech game that got wet because that, that, that also got wet because but Georgia Tech wasn't any good that year. So that wouldn't have been the difference. They were, they were, well, they were five and six. Yeah. Not, not a big 12 champion. Now, Eric, in the defense of you, I'll defend UCF in this regard, Eric, I'm, I'm, I'm going from both sides. I agree with what you're saying. Easier said than done though. I, I, I there are teams that just, you know, this, they're not going to play UCF. I'm sure there's FIU yeah. probably much has the same problem. They're going to be teams that don't want to play them under any circumstances. So it's a two way street on that. It is what it is. Um, but, you know, look, I think my I think Eric's point is play the competition. Fans want to enjoy good games. And I do think it puts a lot of pressure on the staff on coaches to go let 10, 12 wins a year is a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, once again, you know, I'm, I'm not saying uh, because you guys make the, the, the Trump card here, which is 
it's a, it's a two-way street to get that game scheduled. My, my point is maybe you have to kind of sacrifice your pride and eventually I'll repeat this again. UCF's not going to continue, going to be able to continue to point to, Hey, this is bad for our finances five, six, seven years down the road. And you just say, Hey, all right, we'll play you insert school anywhere, anytime you pick the place, because we think we've built a program that's good enough that we can go to your place and beat you. And I mean, once again, the argument against that, I guess you could say, would be Boise State and scheduling, but I don't even believe that Boise State, and I'm sure some Boise State fans are going to jump in my Twitter mentions and, and, and prove me wrong, but I don't even I don't even think that Boise State, you know, I, actually, I take the back. I think they had a couple of kickoff classics. They may have taken a neutral side they, game. They did, uh, but right? the, the difference was that was the only power or autonomy five game that they played those years. Like, I remember they went right, to Washington, right. D.C. They beat Virginia Tech. They, they did schedule a home-and-home home with Oregon back in the day, um, but that was... That was just before Oregon turned into Oregon. Um, and uh, I think there was one. They played Georgia in Atlanta, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in another kickoff classic game, too. So, I mean, you know, and, and Danny White is actually on the record saying, you know, we'll do, you know, a, a kickoff classic kind of game. It's just that, you know, I think he, and in fact, I think he told the, U, the UFAD in the emails that the Orlando Sentinel came up that, you know, we're all for a one off neutral site game. But Florida, Florida, in that case, they were they threw around the idea right. of getting two up in Gainesville, and Danny White said, "No, I'm not doing a two for neutral." Right. So, of course. Of course. You know, and I don't and I don't blame him. I think he's absolutely right about that. So, um, I don't know. But, uh, who knows? They could come out with a schedule announcement today or, or tomorrow or next week that they've got a bunch of SEC teams on the schedule, and we can all just throw this podcast in the trash if that happens. So, <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Eric Henry from Underdog Dynasty. Eric, how can uh, how can folks uh, keep a uh, keep an eye out for you, uh, our fellow knight, uh, working in not enemy territory but foreign territory, shall we say? <laughs> yeah, I, I I like that way of some of summarizing it. Right, uh, you can find me at Underdog Dynasty uh, now. As of about a couple days ago, um, the Five Reasons Sports Network, started up by uh, Ethan Skolnick, a former Sun Sentinel uh, Miami Heat beat writer, I'm doing some stuff with him as well. So you can find me on FiveReasons.com, and you can also find me on Twitter at Eric C Henry underscore. All right, Eric Henry joining us from Underdog Dynasty. Thanks, Eric. Uh, enjoy the uh, hot South Florida summer practices, and uh, well, we'll see you, uh, or or, hot, or actually the hot summers in Tampa as well, because I know you're actually living, working out there, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at some UCF games in the future, all right, man? Yeah, man, you guys will see me soon. Uh, hoping to make the Stanford game and hoping to make the uh, annual USF-UCF war on I-4, so I'll catch you guys later. Sounds good. Stick around. Uh, we'll be right back right here on the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Welcome back to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Uh, Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez, and uh, Brian Murphy back with you. We're going to wrap it up. Okay, so I, I need to, I owe an apology to Ampa L. Jug or Am- Ampal Jug 42. I'm sorry. That's the, that's the, that's your handle on uh, on Twitter. Uh, he sent me a question for Ask the Banneret, and amidst all the questions that I had on Facebook and Twitter, I didn't get to, I didn't get to his. So we owe him an answer on this. Actually, it was kind of a funny question. <laughs> so I want to get to this. Hopefully, and folks, you can ask us any question you want at any point. Uh, send it to us at uh, UCF underscore Banneret on Twitter or send it to us on our Facebook page. We'll answer it in our final segment. Hopefully, we make it like a little bit of a mini weekly segment. That's what I'd like to do anyway. So You can, ask even, you can, even, you can even ask non-sports questions. I'm all here for your philosophical takes. I, I'm, I'm in for, for movie takes. Yeah, I know you're in for the movie takes. I'm in for classic rock takes as well, and uh, also some space talk if you want to get into that. So, uh, Eric, Eric, what are you up on? Right. Well, I got a. Uh, I somebody sent me a question with Murph about baseball that okay. uh, people are cons- people are worried about Murph. So I will. will oh. I'll, he'll address. Ha- Holding People pattern on that. I know. Yeah. yeah, I would say, yeah, I'd say, hope, hope, let, me put, let me put a pin on that one and we'll get to I'm Paul Jug 42. All right, so his question is, and this is actually really funnily framed, ready? Blake Bortles visits you from the future. He, t- <laughs> he tells you that this year UCF football finishes the regular season 11 and 1. Before you can ask for specifics, he flashes his Super Bowl 54 ring and returns to his own time. Which team on this year's slate did UCF lose to, and why? So we're talking about this year. This year, yeah. Regular season. 
I forgot what Super Bowl's coming up this year. <laughs> um, I, I'm kind of on record as saying the game. I'm almost certain that this team, you know, can lose or might lose is at Cincinnati in early October, Friday night. C- Cincinnati, yeah, yeah. I, I. Don't want, I, I I think that that's the biggest that's the biggest trouble game. I the Stanford game has a big chance to it, it, it is going to be a tough game no matter what. I mean because I just think that Stanford's incredibly an incredibly well coached team with David Shaw, and they're extremely disciplined. But if I had to pick the two between the two of them, it would be the at Cincinnati game. And the reason why is because since the, that fan base for Cincinnati, especially if UCF comes in there five and zero. They're going to be amped for that game, and that's a tough place to play. Um, and let's give some credit to Luke Fickle, man. He's done a great job with that Cincinnati program. So uh, credit to them. And it's right before the bye week. Um, uh, let me see. When is Cincinnati's bye week? Have we seen that? Is that – I'm going to pull up their schedule right here. Because that, that one's – that one I'm always going to – okay, so they're at Marshall the previous week. Uh, they have a short week, so – because that game is on a Friday night. But, Eric, what do you think? Is Are you picking the Cincinnati game, too, or another one? Uh, I mean, that's a very cheap pick. I, I, I understand it. I think it's fine. Stanford's fine. I'm going to go Houston. Mm-hmm. Uh, Houston at home. First of all. Okay. Yeah, and, well, here's the thing. I mean, there's a chance they might have to play them twice. So, hopefully, UCF beat them to the, 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 the right one. Um, because... I think we, you know, we've talked about this in previous episodes. I think Houston has the best player in the American Conference, and Eric King, at least the best offensive player. And if you look at UCF, the last two years when they have been on the field against a guy who's been the best offensive player in the field, they've had trouble. And you go back to Henderson and Memphis last year, both games as the running back, and then to Quinton Flowers, two year in 2017, UCF had big problems. And I think De'Aaron King is way better than the Quinton Flowers was. I think he's a better passer than Flowers is. And UCF's had trouble against running that game. And that could be a game where UCF may not have enough points to keep up with Houston, either in the regular season or possibly in the conference championship game. Eric, you have yeah, that. Uh, oh, go ahead, Murph. I'm sorry. No, that could be tough. Look at the schedule, how that sets up, too. I, I mean, they, they've got uh, Temple. They're at Temple before that. So that could be a, a pretty bruising game. But, I mean, that Temple, I don't think it's a push over. It's like 80 push over this year. So that coming back home, yeah, coming back home after a road game, you know, that, that Houston game, and they, as Eric said, like not only is he the best player, but rushing quarterbacks too, man. I mean, the, the Quentin Flowers, I think, still haunts, uh, you know, my mind as far yeah. as you know, rushing quarterbacks, uh, dual threat quarterbacks can really kill this team still. Yeah, that's the one problem about I think on the defense is that when you have a mobile quarterback like that, it can they can they can cause a lot of havoc because it's difficult to sometimes it is get, difficult to get them to turn the ball over so eric you had that baseball question for murph too so we've had a lot of departures recently in ucf baseball another one this week with coach <laughs> klosterman which murph will address in a moment is now a head yeah. coach at bryant we mentioned yes. earlier as well ian is leaving the sid uh, we had the director of ops leaving, although we found out they've already got a new uh, person in there, former yeah. player, which Steven, Brian will bring up. S- Stephen Brank is coming back, yeah. Although we, hey, we, lost, Jeff just brought yeah. It up. we lost uh, yeah. we lost Ted Tom, the other assistant coach, the volunteer uh, assistant. Yeah, yeah. Some, a couple players left. Uh, a couple? Things and, yeah, a couple players. Uh, a few, you know, I don't know, Brian. <laughs> I don't know what couple, the number, number is. Couple, number is but. A couple dozen. It was, but anyway. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. so, so we have a listener, Tammy, is asking: With all the baseball people leaving, is Brian next? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm always looking for work. <laughs> so you know. Wow. <laughs> Listen, if I hear if I hear you've taken a job at the Athletic, I'm going to be pissed. Here's why I'm joining the Athletic. <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> joining the Athletic. Here's why. <laughs> no, I I I, I mind I mind the, uh, one of the familiar faces that sticks around for for fall ball. Hey guys, all right. We're only, we're only like three, we're only like four months away from fall ball. Oh god, is there is there going to be anyone there? Yes, I, Dalton <laughs> Wingo. Will, Dalton Wingo will show up. And Greg Lovelady. I, I believe Josh. Yes, Greg Lovelady will be there with with new coaches. They should name a new assistant coach in pretty short order here. 
Um, you know, Joe, Joe Sheridan's repaired shoulder uh, will be back. Uh, yes, people will be there. Baseball, we play it in November. It's about uh, it. It's it'll be fun. it'll be Joe Sheridan and Dalton Wingo just out there playing catch for five days. Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> Pepper. Uh, all right, but Murph, I mean, I, I mean, she does have the, the quite. I mean, address the Klosterman move to Bryant there for those that may not have been following it closely there, because uh, I don't know, you know, it's kind of late here, so maybe some people are caught off guard. Right, and I think you know, again, like it, it, it's kind of weird that you see Coach leave at this juncture. But uh, this assistant coach who, after he, you know, Ryan Hoffman played in the minor leagues for a number of years, and then right out of the minor leagues, he was hired by UCF. The only coaching job he ever knew was basically UCF. He was here for, I believe, eight years. Yeah. And now he gets a, shot, and now he gets a shot at a head job uh, up, in, up in Rhode Island, up in Bryant University. Uh, he does have some ties there when he was actually playing in double A. Uh, up in up in that area for the Blue Jays organization, he met his wife up there, uh, and all, her family's in, from that area, so he does have some connections in that area. And again, you can't fault a guy for going from an assistant coach role to a head coaching role. I know Bryant University may not be this big name school, but he's a head coach now. That's what matters. Yeah, um, I, I do think you know it's, it's it's interesting to speculate that you know t- you know Ted Tom, you know he left. Yeah, a week, like 10 days before this, he left to go to Western Kentucky because he, he takes a non-paying job here at UCF and he takes a paying assistant job at Western Kentucky. Would he have stayed at UCF and rather wanted to replace Klosterman uh, if he, you know, if he had known Klosterman was going to go? You know, we don't have a firm answer on that. We've asked. I believe that uh, Ted Tom probably knew. That classroom was going to go regardless. I mean, it's not like this thing just happened. So I believe Ted Tom, no matter, even, if, even if he knew classroom was going to go, still would have departed to Western Kentucky as well. Yeah, and and, and props to Klosty also. You know, he's been here since 2012. He was actually hired by Terry Rooney. And among yeah. the guys he worked with, Darnell Sweeney, Chris Talladay, um, DJ Hicks, and Travis Shreve. Um, and... and uh, that was that was in his first year here, so that was a long time ago. But um, but yeah, it's uh, nonetheless. Congratulations to him on getting that job. He's he's been working on trying to get a job for quite some time, and I believe that. And and this will be his first head coaching job. And congratulations to him. And the Greg Love Lady coaching tree continues to expand. I guess he would also count for the Terry Rooney coaching tree, wouldn't he? Along with Cliff Godwin, yes. I would suppose. Yeah. So you know, Ryan yes. gets. Ryan gets double credit on that. So, um, so that yeah, that was the the news that we wanted to address, and also the uh, uh, I know we're wrapping with this basically, but hey, basketball schedules out. Did you see that? Let's <laughs> go. <laughs> oh. All right, so uh, ho- home games. This is what everyone's really interested in. Prairie View is the opener Saturday, November 9th. Uh, home games include Miami on November 12th. College of Charleston on Saturday the 23rd. UCF does go out to the Wooden Legacy Tournament, which is out in Anaheim, California, um, November 28th through December 1st. They're opening against Penn in that field. Um, Home games also against the New Jersey Institute of Technology, the alma mater of my uncle, Tony, by the way. Uh, I had to get that in. That's Uh, what did it. Green, yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, uh, Green Bay, Sacred Heart, Bethune, Cookman. So, uh, and then a game at Oklahoma. So, uh, so there's your there's your non conference uh, slate as of right now for uh, for UCF men's basketball. Um, well, not exactly it's, loading it, it up, but I but I but I, I don't blame them with all I the new know, guys, right? That's a pretty good schedule. I mean, yeah, that, it's not bad. That's a pretty strong schedule. Oh, yeah, it's not, bad. Miami, it's not bad. You get Miami. You go into Oklahoma. You're going to play in the Wooden Tournament, which depending on how you play, you have teams like Arizona in the field, Providence is in the field, uh, Wake Forest is in the field. So uh, if you look at the history of UCF basketball, this is actually a pretty darn good non-conference. Keep in mind the conference schedule is uh, still to be sorted out from a date standpoint. You kind of know the opponents, but you don't know uh, the dates. But what more? I, uh, credit to Johnny Dawkins to get – Miami to come here, part of a home and home. Oklahoma is a part of a home and home. They got to go to Norman, December twenty. I think it's fantastic, and I think 
the thing about Coach Dawkins that he's bring, he has brought to this program is credibility and respect. And I think he's kind of following the same deal that he did at Stanford. He's not going to be afraid to play people. And I think the formula is you're going to play at a very mar- a good tournament, which he's done since he's been here. And I think he's trying to get a marquee home opponent and a marquee road game every year. And yeah. uh, salute to him. And I and uh, this is my goal for the year, gentlemen, uh, or at least through the end of 2019. This is my goal. The one thing that I want to do, and I, and I, you know, I want to be at every football game, yes, but I will sacrifice one of the football games if this can happen. I'm going to try my best. It may not happen, but – uh, that Wooden Classic tournament is obviously during uh, Thanksgiving weekend. It's, it's, I believe the 28th is Thanksgiving Day, and it runs yep. through that Sunday. Uh, so obviously there's Thanksgiving, it's the first day of games, then you have the 29th, which is the second day of games. That's the same day, obviously, it's Black Friday, UCF, uh, USF, one and four game. I am trying, my, I will try my best to, I will be at, obviously, the football game on Friday night, and then take either a red eye or a early morning flight from here in Orlando Woo-hoo! out to LA to cover the Saturday game, whoever UCF is playing in Anaheim because, well, one, I want to go back to California, uh, and two, I think that'll be fun. I think it'll be fun to, to cover, like, two events on separate That coasts. is unbelievable! Of of You're out of your mind. <laughs> I want, I would, that is well, phenomenal. I think, I would, I, so I would obviously, I would steal this up right now, but plane tickets are obviously like ridiculous because it's Thanksgiving weekend. But this is this is like this is like I, I'm gonna beg my, my my father like for a Christmas gift. Can you give me a ticket out to California <laughs> to do this? I mean, I, I, I would have a place to stay. I would stay at his house. Uh, it's fine. But I, I'm gonna try to do this. If I can go from if I can go from the bounce house to what should be still known as the Anaheim Arrowhead Pond, uh, that'd be great. The pond, love it. You're trying yes. to pull off a Mark Daniels, like Mark Daniels, two a couple, uh, but yours is even more difficult. In, in, but but Mark a couple years ago called the American Conference Championship game in football against Memphis, and then I think went to Alabama to call Alabama, Alabama right the next day. Yeah, and the game they won. Yeah, I remember I remember listening to that game right after you know the announcement with the Auburn Peach Bowl came out. You know, I was trying to stay to interview you guys. And there's there's Mark on the call from. Now, now let's let's say the men's team gets to the championship game on Sunday, December first. You think Mark is gonna Mark will be Mark is gonna head out there? You think, isn't he? Can I catch a ride? Can I catch a ride on his private jet? I, or no, no, no I, I think he's gonna be hitching a ride on your Gulf Stream, no. Mr. Murphy. No, 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 no. Well, first of all, the the champion the, the the Wooden conflicts with the Black Friday weekend. The championship game is the following weekend, so UCF will not be at Wooden, so Mark can have to. Yeah, or, right. I, I would assume Scott. Asked no, 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 no. I'm, well, I'm talking about the 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 the, the, the wooden legacy championship the wooden day, which is Sunday, right. December first. That's um, which and is even, I believe, two days later. Yeah. They don't, no matter what happens, I believe I believe every team plays plays four games. Uh, so even if you're not in the championship, you still play a game that Sunday. Yeah. So, yeah, I believe it'll be fun. Yeah, that's Three a great games. tournament. Three uh, games. And it's going to get good TV exposure. So I'm, I'm rooting for you, Murph. I love it. I, I like it. I, I mean, it should be like I, a- it should be great, right? Like, I can get a Friday night, Black Friday game, take an early morning flight out, be there Saturday, Sunday, leave Sunday night, be back for the Monday morning AAC championship uh, presser. Whoa. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Well, it's. <sighs> It's your funeral, man. Jeez, Louise. Uh, anybody, oh, come on. Anybody, the anybody, anybody at SB Nation want to give me a race? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the tournament field, Arizona, Charleston, Long Beach, Pepperdine, uh, Providence, UCF, Wake, and Penn. So, um, not, not a bad. Not, not a bad. But I, I hope we get a tournament what back here in Orlando at some point. What are you, what are you downplaying? This no, I'm not. Da- no, I'm not downplaying it. Arizona's a good. Arizona's a good team. Penn's traditionally very good. Charleston, interestingly enough, UCF's first ever win over a top twenty-five team was against Charleston at the old arena. Wake Forest. Um, Long Beach is a team that reason like in the last couple of years has been disappointing, but they're a team that always right. challenges itself with like this ridiculous non-conference schedule they're always battle tested well we'll see how battle tested they are here so uh that should be well so so there so there's the wooden legacy for you with ucf men's basketball um and we'll we await anxiously the uh 
uh, the conference schedule to finish out for UCF. All right, let's finish this thing up here. Uh, what do we got coming up, Eric? I know we're going to finish out your top ten here. You're, we're into the top ten on the uh, top twenty-five games. That's right. And uh, so, so there's that. You got anything else you might have on tap? Yeah, I'm just going to be amused on uh, Thursday, depending on when people are listening to this, and everybody flipping out about a preseason coaches poll, which comes out uh, Thursday. So oh, everybody's God, those come out. out on Thursday. Oh, God, That's right, now baby. I write something just on mo- that. Just as, as exciting as future schedules, playing teams like a million years from now. Yes, we're going to – yes, people will be flipping out about, hey, our team's over. We're, we're ranked too low. We're ranked too high, even though it really doesn't matter. All right, all right give, yeah, give, but, give uh, me an over-under. Give me an over-under real quick on, on where you think UCF's going to be. 19. Okay. Murphy taking the over the under. Uh, that was my number. I think I said 19 a couple days ago. I think me and Eric talked about this. Uh, so I'll take uh, I'll take the over, but it'll be like 18. Okay. Over as in better. I'll, I'll, I'll give you 19. I'll take 20 if you want. Okay. I'll take 19. You, you can take I'll take the 20. Take... I'll take the 20. All right. Um, All right I'll take 18 then. We'll Jeff, the price is right here. There we go. <laughs> closest without going yes. over. Well, which one is over? Is it is it closer to twenty five or closer to one? Is this sounds what? like this sounds like that math question that's dividing the internet right now. Anyway, look, get me out of here. By I don't the want way, to talk about it math. shouldn't be dividing the internet, people. It's your order of operations. Pim to us. Follow me. By the way, there are two correct answers to that. Anyway, Murph, go ahead. What what did you have coming up? Live, live Banneret meeting, Jeffrey. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you. Uh, you'll, you'll write the top 25 preseason poll article. You can go ahead. I'll, I'll delegate that off to you. Yeah, I know it's funny. yeah. I know you're looking forward to that. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. Um, <laughs> uh, I am currently writing about the uh, quarterback. As we talked to you today, who you heard from in this podcast. Um, again, just uh, talking about uh, what we heard from him, and, and, and you know, that, uh, that article will be up. Uh, well, I'm working on it right now. That article will be up Thursday. I'm also working on an article about, yes, the return season two of 1-0 and because every team's got to have a new slogan every year except for UCF football, which it, where 1-0 and is now turned from being a motto to basically a, a brainwashed, like, it, it, like at all times, it's just, it's just, it is part of the fabric of the university now. It's it is so brilliant. I love it. So anyway, it's one and zero. It's back. I talked to a lot of guys at me today about that and, and, and their feelings about it. Uh, I got a lot of a lot of small stuff coming up uh, about how we need to get a nickname for the corner uh, for the secondary for the defensive secondary and uh, other small stuff on the way too. All right, I've got. Uh, I'm going to try and get. Uh, I've remember I told you about on media day in the first segment how I succeeded in not asking a single football question to anybody. Mm. Well, I answer, I asked all the players that I talked to all these same questions, and uh, you will get a little piece of that uh, once every couple days or so in in uh, a, a little branded segment that or or, or a little branded uh, uh, piece of content that we will call not talking about football with uh, <laughs> with each player. So hey, look, we keep it simple. I, Jordan Johnson's have- first up, by the way. I passed by you talking to Neville, uh, Neville Clark, and, and he was cracking up. He was cracking up laughing. He was Apparently. trying to. He was trying so hard to think about some of the questions. He was like, I, "He's like, I can't. I, I don't know, man. I'll, I'm kind of stuck on this." But uh, all the guys were great. I loved talking to all of them. I mean, it's such a. It, they're all great dudes to talk to. Um, and, and like I can remember, like even two years ago, like when the young guys came out, like you know. They were kind of, they kind of didn't really know what to say, you know. They were a little unsure of themselves. Like I remember talking to Adrian Killens his freshman year, and he was kind of, kind of a little wide-eyed, didn't know what was going on. But you know, now he's a senior. Can you believe Adrian Killens is a senior? My God, I know. We're all getting old, man. All right, let's wrap this thing up. Uh, For Eric Lopez and Brian Murphy, I'm Jeff Sharon. Follow us at BlackAndGoldBanneret.com, UCF underscore Banneret on Twitter and Facebook.com slash black and gold banneret subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcast apple podcast google play soundcloud you name it it's all there for brian and eric i'm jeff and also thanks to eric henry for joining us you can follow him at eric c henry underscore eric c henry underscore for all of us here at black and gold banneret i'm jeff sharon thanks for listening catch you next week